Good evening, and welcome to this special edition of Doctors on Call on the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Dr. Paula Termulin, Regional Campus Dean at the University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth campus, and I'm your host this evening. We're continuing this series of special programs to answer viewer questions about the coronavirus. I wanna thank everybody for sending a few in in advance. And this week we have a special emphasis on the importance of advanced care planning, especially during this time of the pandemic. Tonight's guests have essential information to share about the value of a living will. The telephone numbers and email address for your questions can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Amy Greminger, faculty member at the University of Minnesota Medical School Duluth campus and internal medicine physician at Essentia Health, and Dr. Jonathan Sandy, director of advanced care planning for Essentia's East Market. Members of the WDSC staff are waiting to take your calls and emails, and once again, I thank them for taking such good care of us and ensuring that we're doing proper social distancing. Once again, we have plenty of questions for our panelists, so let's just get right to it. So Dr. Sandy, advanced care planning, what is it? Well, um, I've been working at advanced care planning at Essentia Health for over six years, and in my opinion, it's one of the top four things we in medicine could be better at to improve health care for individuals and for our health care system. To put it briefly, advanced care planning is all about getting to know the patient as a person and de then developing a care plan for the patient accounting for their medical illnesses but also their goals, values, and beliefs and what is important to them. And is that usually done just with the patient or do, are families sometimes involved? Ideally, we have that conversation with the patient and what we would call the patient's agent. That is the person the patient would want to speak for them if we were no longer able to speak with the patient. That's a very important component that the agent needs to be present. Okay, so, so Dr. Greminger, why are we talking about this now? Well, I, I think any time is a good time to talk about advanced care planning, but especially now with really a very real prospect of severe illness that could impact anybody from the very young to the very elderly. I think it's a really good opportunity for people to take something that feels out of control and take some control back because people have very different wishes about things that they might want. And so this is an opportunity for people to, to really experience express their wishes so that the medical system can then follow whatever their wishes are. Good, okay, and so, so Dr. Sandy, what kind of resources might be available to help patients and their families or their agents do this? Well, there are many and they are growing. Um, a very important resource for people in Minnesota and also Wisconsin is Honoring Choices Minnesota and Honoring Choices Wisconsin. Uh, they both have beautiful websites, uh, very easy to use, and on those websites you can learn not only about the nuts and bolts of advanced care planning, but also download forms, advanced directives, there's information about how to choose the most appropriate agent for you, and there are also resources for patients and their agents and families to think about in the context of the COVID pandemic. The Honoring Choices Minnesota website is particularly powerful. You know, and I've understood that Honoring Choices is also working with our American Indian community uh, in Minnesota to help ensure that they're all, the, all the cultural components are also respected and that people have an opportunity to really engage in this process. Right, Honoring Choices started out as an effort of the Twin Cities Medical Society, mm -hmm. Medical Association, and they've since broadened their effort to be statewide and they have been uh, very um, forthright about approaching minority and immigrant communities. And so, for example, in the Twin Cities, they have the forms available in Hmong and Russian, and uh, they're doing a special project right now with the Native American communities to make sure that we can do this for them in a culturally appropriate way. So you mentioned forms. Mm -hmm. So what kind of paperwork does somebody want to have and how does that get transferred perhaps if they're hospitalized or just walk us through a little bit of that. 
Okay, well, first I want to back up the conversation, our conversation about the conversation, mm -hmm. because advanced care planning is really about a conversation. Okay. That's the most important thing about the conversation. And the conversation ought to be person-centered, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, we're all in medicine. We were taught pretty well how to apply science to human beings. I can't speak for you guys, but I was trained at Mayo, and no one taught me anything about how to incorporate patients' goals, values, and wishes into my recommendations. So the fundamental component of an advanced care planning conversation is a, trained, a person trained in the techniques with the patient and the agent, and you start out by assessing what the patient understands about his or her illness, getting a sense of that, and then there's a series of beautiful questions like, so we'll come back to your illness. I first want now to learn more about you as a person. So for example, if you are having a great day, what are you doing? Who are you with? You know, where are you? Mm -hmm. And you foster communication between the patient and the agent about that. The next most important question is what do you hope for in the care of your illness? And you don't let them answer that once. You kind of, friend, friend, in a friendly way, uh, encourage them to keep answering the hope question. Because usually, for example, in my field, a stage four cancer patient, uncurable, they will usually say a cure. The response is, I understand that wish and I mm -hmm. hope that comes true for you and I'll do everything in my power. But if that doesn't come true, what else would you hope for? Okay. And then what else would you hope for? And by the time you've answered the hope question on several different levels, you really have a pretty good understanding of the patient. Another question is what are your fears? Another question is what would be an unacceptable outcome as we try to treat your illness? And it's only after you answer all those questions and foster a discussion between the patient and the agent that you then use that information to apply to a certain medical decision or many. So that brings to mind another question though. And so Dr. Greminger, do you have to have a serious illness to go through this process? I think it's a good exercise for everybody to think about not only what they would want, but who they, they would want, who they would want making those decisions. Even for very young people, something catastrophic could happen. People mm -hmm. could be in an accident. Life is unpredictable. Um, and so I think one of the things that these conversations can ha help people realize is who, who, who are good choices of people to have make those decisions for you? And who are people that are wonderful people to have in your life, but maybe that would be a harder role for them to, to, mm -hmm. to fill. So I think, you know, you want to think about somebody who can do the things that you want them to do, not what they feel, but what you would want them to do to make sure that they understand your wishes so that it's not just, oh yeah, that's that person, they'll take care of me, to make sure that they understand what you would want um, and to make sure that they can be okay having had to make those kinds of decisions. And, and those, those, that and, and some other stuff too, but those are some things that would help make somebody the right person to, to put, that, put in that kind of place of making decisions if you were unable to. So Dr. Sandy mentioned something that we're of an era where we really didn't learn this in medical school very mm -hmm. well. I had a little bit of it, but I wanna make sure that Dr. Greminger has an opportunity just to share with the audience what we're doing today. So I, we know about our first year students and? Um, so with our students, all of our students go through an end of life class, um, which is a wonderful opportunity, um, I, I think, to, to learn about these issues. All of our students get to, a chance to participate in um, having some education on these conversations from a, a very early, they're in their very first year of medical school. And I'm really excited because I didn't have that opportunity. Um, and I think it's gonna help all of their patients in the future have better outcomes. So our viewers are actually really honing in on some of the details and we have a question about, is it okay for a notary to watch me sign a medical directive around this or does it have to be a physician? So that's a really good question. And so the, the and to try and circle back Paula to the question you asked me when I went to the conversation route, uh, the most important thing is to have a conversation with your agent so that agent knows your goals, values, and beliefs because any form you fill out cannot accurately predict what 
might exactly be happening. Mm -hmm. So the agent has a better chance of doing what you want if they understand your goals, values, and beliefs. The form is important, and how it is completed legally is state-specific. So for example, in Minnesota, a, notarized, a notary can watch you sign it and then put their stamp on it. In Minnesota, you can also complete a form that's legal if you have two witnesses. But they don't have to be notaries. Correct. Okay. Right. And well, Wisconsin does not have notaries involved in this process, so it's two witnesses, and Wisconsin has very specific criteria for who can be a witness. Uh, you can't have someone in your family in Wisconsin who might benefit from your death be a witness. Well, that makes sense, right? Right. Yeah. So it's state-specific. That's the key thing. Okay. And uh, the websites can help with that. Okay. And so we have another question here uh, on this topic, and it says, should someone get a medical directive if they don't have family living locally? So thinking a little bit about how, how does one handle that? I think that that's actually a really great reason to have a medical directive, um, so that if you want your family making the decisions for you, um, you, you would take the time to kind of go through and parse out with them what you would want. But if you, you know, I think that is the point, is that the goal is to be patient-centered. And sometimes people want their family as their health care agent. And sometimes, perhaps, a family is out of state and distant. Maybe a close friend or somebody that really understands you and your wishes might be the choice that they would have. And so the point of, of, of kind of outlining that is picking the, the right person who can do the right job for you. It does not have to be family. The one thing I would caution is, um, Sometimes when people have gone through and picked out healthcare agents, that's, and, and then we have to look toward those agents, that can be a surprise to people. And so I think it's a good idea to have that conversation with your family or people that might be um, expecting to be part of that decision making to, to help them understand before they get to the, to be transparent with everybody and help them understand before you get to the point of who you want making your decisions and why. I, I would just like to jump in. That, that, that was a very insightful question without family. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, if you have family that you would like to be a decision maker, then we can now do these conversations virtually and connect everybody, yep. even though they're not in the state. But if there's a person living on their own and they don't have family, that's really important because if those people get sick and they come in the hospital, we don't know who to talk to. And so, as Amy said, it's not necessarily family. It's a friend, it's a good friend, or a minister, um, social worker, perhaps. Um, and you can imagine what it's like for uh, people who are less fortunate, who don't have a community of support. So th yeah. that's a really important question. Yeah. We struggle with that. So we're starting to get a few other questions tonight, and I want to make sure we run through a few other things. And I think we've learned a lot about how important this particular topic is. And I think we're all spending a lot more time with each other in homes mm -hmm. or virtually and really opening up some different lines of communication. So we'll just encourage all of our viewers to think about this, and we encourage you to go to those websites and, and get one filled out. And I would also add, sorry. No, oh, go ahead. <laughs> you know, for St. Luke's, you can call the switchboard. They have advanced care planning resources and Essentia Health on the website has a pretty robust description of advanced care planning and how people can proceed and the phone numbers to call and so on and so forth. So, The, the other thing I would add is that sometimes people think of this topic as a taboo, yeah. but what I would say is that when I've seen families that have had these conversations mm -hmm. that are then called on to make these decisions, they really feel like it was a gift from the patient because they're not guessing about what they want. Right. They know exactly what they would want. And I think that guessing uh, is very stressful for people. So even though having these conversations can feel a little awkward, I do think it's a gift for everybody. I completely agree. Well, and so I know that you work in hospice, mm -hmm. and, and it's a great way for us to sort of start on some of the other topics that people are interested in. Tell us a little bit about what you've, how you've been caring for patients and families in this time. Right, you know, I think um, it certainly is a different time. We are doing a lot more telemedicine as everybody is, um, but those, those central tenants of hospice, that we meet people where they're at and we, we take them where they are and we find out what their goals are and try to help them with their goals, 
still hold through. St still hold through. So if people's goals are to stay at home, we will work with them to try to help them at home. Um, you know, if people's goals are to to have, you know, to really work on comfort and pain management, we will work with them to do that. And maybe it's maybe it's in a little bit different setting. Maybe it's virtually. Maybe it's doing some of that. And sometimes it's in person too, depending on what people's needs are. But we are still there doing that work with families. And, and you mentioned earlier, people are wearing masks. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're protecting, you know, the patients being protected, the, right. the and the folks that are coming to visit are being protected. So th these kinds of services are still. Abs available. Absolutely. Our, our nurses all have PPE. We are universally using PPE with or masks and, and things with all of our interactions. Um, we are giving our patients masks as well so that they can feel safer when we come in the house. Well, and so Dr. Sandy, as an oncologist, mm -hmm. just tell us a little bit about cancer patients are still getting their care, right? Oh, well, yes. Actually, uh, speaking personally for me, I'm actually busier clinically than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. Uh, our section at Essentia is meeting the metrics that were designed for us before COVID. So cancer care has not stopped. Everybody who needs chemotherapy comes in for chemotherapy. Um, we're maximizing use of telehealth, telemedicine, and I think that's a, a gift, if you can call it that, of COVID. Um, and, um, you know, people who are newly diagnosed get exactly what they need and in some ways it's actually been easier for me because people like you aren't as busy as you used to be and yeah Paula we, we, need, right we need a surgery can you <laughs> yeah. go do it well, I'll do it tomorrow it's like okay yeah and the same thing for imaging so we we just keep going yeah we do have contingency plans if the twin ports becomes a high surge area mm -hmm. we might have to make some changes which I would say is one of the reasons protection is so important, so none of us are put in that position. Well, and so I want to note that Julie from here in Duluth is thanking us or thanking the show for emphasizing going to emergency if they, uh, going to the emergency room because it's safe, or going to your physician's office or continuing your care. Uh, it helped her and we want to make sure we're helping everyone else. So if you have a health problem, in some ways you've got more time to get it done now because we have a little bit more availability because of the efficiencies in some ways of virtual care. Yeah. So. Exactly. So a um, couple other things that folks are thinking about. Um, we've had uh, several questions about blood banks and how are we protecting? We know that the blood supply was a little short because we can't run the normal sort of, you know, bl blood uh, 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 donation kinds of events. So Dr. Sandy, do you, can you talk to us a little bit about what we know? Sure, and uh, I actually did some research about this because <laughs> you warned me about this question. And I talked to the director of our uh, pathology services who networked with the blood banks across the country. So I think one thing that's important to understand is, to our knowledge, no coronavirus have ever, has ever been transmitted by blood. So that goes for SARS, that goes for MERS, and that goes for everything we know so far about COVID. Uh, and in terms of donation, we don't screen patients for COVID if they're going to donate blood in terms of a blood test because that's not where you're gonna find it. Mm -hmm. It's only critically ill people who are in the ICU uh, and very ill that have evidence of the COVID virus in their blood and that's usually not the intact virus. So people who want to donate can call their blood bank and they go to the blood bank and they're screened as we all are when we enter the hospital. Have you had a fever? You know. Uh, up to now 12 symptoms, and if not, they will donate. And the FDA feels very strongly that we need to protect our blood supply. And we are facing a national shortage because people who are severely ill with COVID need all kinds of blood products. So I would strongly urge people to continue to donate. Well, and so, you know, there's a question very timely here. It says, is it okay to donate blood if you have COVID-19 antibodies? Now the antibodies actually occur after you've had the infection and we're trying to understand what that's gonna mean right now. There's a lot and in fact, we're hoping by the end of the month, we'll understand more to be able to share it on the show, but it's evolving and understanding that. But all those blood products are tested before they're given to another patient. And we know that there's serum right now or a blood byproduct that's being collected from patients who've had COVID to be given to others in a, in a clinical trial, so. Right, so that, that's a very important potentially very important therapeutic endeavor is mm -hmm. to take the serum from someone who has had the virus, 
who shows the antibodies, take it out of that patient and then deliver it to a patient who's very sick. And it's a form of passive immunity where the antibodies that the patient receives can then aid the patient's immune system in attacking the virus. So I would say, I mean, see if you agree with this, you know, if, if you think you've had COVID, and we know that it's probably been around longer than what we were thinking. In fact, we had a question, you know, I was sick in January, could it have been COVID? And the answer is possibly, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, don't be shy about giving that blood and right. donating, because we really need those products right now. Yeah, I would say that if you think you may have had COVID, I would encourage you to call the blood bank and say, here, hey, this is my story. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Can I donate? So the because it's changing so rapidly. Correct. You almost have to call. Right. And if you're healthy, we really need the blood. So, yeah. And yeah. I would just put in a plug in for cancer patients. We're continuing care unabated. And they need those blood they products. They need blood products. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a couple more questions about advanced directives. Uh, one is, can I use legal Zoom to create a medical directive and had it, have it notarized? So. I would say potentially yes. I must say I don't understand what legal Zoom is with mm -hmm. enough certainty. The point about a notary is the notary is supposed to be able to visualize you signing it. Right. If you complete the document and take it to a notary, they're going to tell you I can't sign it because I didn't watch you sign it. So that is potentially possible, but I would need to understand more about those specifics because the person who notarizes has to be able to witness you signing it. Yeah. Or that that mechanism has to be honored in some way. Well, and I think to Dr. Gr you know, Dr. Greminger, really, you spoke a lot about having the conversation. Mm -hmm. So the paperwork's important, mm -hmm. but the conversation is probably even more important because that person can act on your behalf. And here we have a question about can a donor, if if I'm a donor, and I'm assuming like a, thinking about being an, an organ donor, could my health care advocate change that? In general, I don't. I think that people, people who are donors, can express that opinions. And healthcare power of attorneys in general don't usually. If if the patient wants to be a donor, other people don't change that in general. But you might have some more information. Uh, th that's a very good question, and it's very tricky. But if a patient is a designated donor, and that's the official term from the organ procurement agencies, they are empowered legally to mm -hmm. honor the patient's wishes mm -hmm. over the objections of mm -hmm. the agent, mm -hmm. which can be very, very difficult. But again, it, spe it speaks to the importance of the conversation. The conversation and then, and then actually verifying that you had that conversation by writing it down, if right. possible. Right, okay. and if, if the person you want to be your agent uh, can't meet your wishes, for example, about donation, then that may not be the person that should be your agent. So there was a question that happened a few weeks ago that we, we touched on, but it's actually relevant to this. And it had to do with someone who had, in that, in that type of document, had said, you know, I really don't want to be on life support. This isn't really what I would want towards the end of my life. And they wanted to know if they could change their mind. Any patient that retains decision-making capacity can change their mind at any time. Yep. At so, the last second. Yeah. If you say, I'd like, you know, I want to change my mind and do something, you can. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, until you're completely unable to speak for yourself, you drive your own boat. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Greminger, I know you've also worked a lot with uh, folks that are in group care. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us a little bit about um, what's being done to protect our, our patients that are in skilled nursing facilities and group homes? Yeah. You know, I think. Um, nursing homes all have individual policies, but I, all the nursing homes that I know of are really looking very carefully at their infection control policies, and they're being very, very um, careful with that. Though Minnesota may be opening up in general, you're not going to see that from the nursing homes. They're still going to be pretty closed probably for for a good long time. And so they're gonna be very cautious with, with visitors. Just like going into any healthcare facility, they are screening. Um, they're screening their uh, staff, they're screening visitors, and visitors come on a very limited basis. They're being very vigilant about personal protective equipment for all of their staff and, and for visitors as well. Um, and so they're really trying to put in very good um, social distancing, um, 
uh, you know, very careful and cautious visitor policies and good infection control in general. Great. So we've got a couple, we're com coming up on the half hour here, and so we, have, we do have a little bit of a rapid fire. So are there special masks for asthmatics? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Not that I know of I would either. say if an asthmatic needs a mask, they ought to be looking for an N95. And an, okay. Yeah. And someone is on warfarin, which is a blood thinner. Is it okay to go in and get tested? Is it safe? For the INR, yes. Okay. Yes. So yep. they should go in because, yes. again, it's good medical care. Right. All right. Um, we've had a question about vitamin D, and I don't know that we really have the time to answer that one tonight. So we're going to save that for next week. Um, but one last question here is that if somebody has multiple health problems, should they get both the flu vaccine and that coronavirus vaccine when it becomes available? And why might both be important? I think that's a great question. If it was me, I would absolutely get both. You could get sick from the flu and you could get sick from coronavirus. Being at, um, having one does not mean you can't get the other. In fact, you might be at increased risk for getting the other infection if your immune system is already weakened from one of the infections. So keeping up on vaccines, that's good medicine. All right, well, thank you both very much. Dr. Amy Greminger and Dr. Jonathan Sandy and our phone staff and crew for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Please join me again next week when our guests will be Dr. Kathy McCarty and Dr. Dan Nikovich. Don't let complacency sneak in and ruin all the work you've done to stay healthy. Watch your social distancing, wash your hands, and sanitize those touch surfaces. Thank you for watching and have a healthy week.